Pacific seafarers have been traveling the oceans for thousands of years. These voyagers felt at home on the water, knowing it would feed them wherever they went. They understood the winds and the currents, and they trusted the birds to lead them to new lands. In this film, we set out to explore an interesting Hawaiian legend that has fallen by the wayside, but holds the key to the colonization of Hawaii and Eastern Polynesia. I'm standing here looking out over the Waipio Valley on the big island of Hawaii. This sacred place is the ancestral home of the Hawaiian royal family. And here begins a tale of mystery and intrigue. Scientists assert that these Hawaiian islands have been populated and inhabited for around about a thousand years. Yet, the oral history of the royal Hawaiian family tells a different tale. Their story tells of arrival on these shores a long time earlier than that, around about 2,000 years ago. Why has their story been ignored? Now, the word Hawaii or Hawaiki actually means homeland to all Polynesians. Could that be a hint as to whether this is actually the crucible of all Hawaiian and Polynesian society? And as the Waipu Valley was, according to the Hawaiians, the political and cultural center for society, we decided that it was logical to begin our perplexing story right here. As we bounce our way down into this sacred valley of the kings, we wonder if our guide Hulalani, a direct descendant of the chiefs who resided in this valley, will be able to show us evidence of the age and depth of history of this sacred place. My name is Hulalani Koinoa i Kamakani Anuheo Puna. And we are at our family property. That was from Chief Opunui to the Hussies to the Kikolanis. And this is our burial area. This is what we used to um, pound the poi in. My grandma used to have the poi pounder that we found here next to that. This is the lahala tree. And with Hi. this around, a coconut tree and tea leaf is how you identify a burial site or heao site. On the side of the poly, you get a big hole with, um, with a coal canoe inside with bones that it's still located up there. As Hulalani is showing us around her family property, she describes a history that goes back only 300 years. And we realize that much has been lost through the passage of time. Tsunamis have also taken their toll on this valley and little or no physical evidence of the deeper history that lies beneath the ground is visible. However, what we did see was some graves of the chiefly families of Hawaiian royalty, but not the one we'd hoped to find. The grave of Solomon Peleolani, the chief who was responsible for documenting the legend that we are investigating, which forms part of the Hukumu Kalani, Hukumu Kahonua. His burial place remains hidden to this day. Our legend begins with a rather unexpected statement that the ancestors of the Hawaiian race came not from the islands of the South Pacific, for the immigrants from that direction were late arrivals there, but from a northern direction, that is, from the land of Kalonika Keke, now known as Alaska. 
Yes, this is a very controversial statement and maybe that's why it has been hidden for so long. Buried in the vaults of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. The legend goes on to describe the provenance of the ancient people of Hawaii and relates the story of a devastating flood that swept over the Hawaiian Islands, forcing their escape to Alaska. And finally, the triumphant return to the islands from Alaska by Chief Nu'u and his family. We will revisit the details of this legend throughout the film. But first, let's have a little geography lesson. Alaska lies about 4,000 kilometers northeast of the Hawaiian Islands and is very nearly the closest mainland to Hawaii. These islands sit at the northern apex of the Polynesian Triangle with New Zealand in the south, Easter Island in the east and Tahiti in the middle. Hawaii is the name of the largest and youngest of the eight islands that comprise this archipelago. Each island has its own unique history, but first we're off to Kauai, the oldest of the islands. And our visit began with a relaxing paddle on the Wailua River and a visit to the Hawaiian village of Kamokila. It was there we met Puna, who told us about a lady over near the Waimea Canyon who we should definitely talk to. Do you have any stories that may have been passed on oh, to I the can relate to you. Only the stories that <clears throat> have been handed down from generations to generations. Uh, you know, that's how stories, uh, that's how uh, history and culture is preserved, is through the oral history. When, at birth, when they were, when they were born, uh, they were really looked over, checked their fingers, see any deformities, yeah? And the midwife would know immediately by the shape of the head or whatever it is, what that destiny is for that child. Oh, how amazing. And many times, a name will be given to that child so that it will perpetuate that, uh, whatever that child's yeah. destiny is. Uh, Hawaiians didn't have melody. It was mainly glottal ch chanting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Melody was brought in after 1820 by the missionaries. Mm -hmm. You know, we think all of these old chants are all, you know, but that's where the history is. Mm -hmm. It's all in the chant. Mm -hmm. Culture's in the chant. Yeah, interesting. In New Zealand, we also heard how Polynesians place great importance on remembering their oral histories. We were taught by, by our old people and it was because we never had a written language that a lot of our stories and our histories were passed on mainly through word of mouth or they were told through a lot of our, our art forms. All of our carvings and our patterns have different meanings. So that was sort of like our writing in days of old. Um, when we walk into our houses of Whakaito or our, our carved houses, we're walking into a visual library. So all of these carvings have different stories that they portray about our ancestors, about the lands that we used to live on. The Māori people being the only, maybe some of the islanders as well actually, that can trace their genealogy and actually recite their genealogy back to the Creator. Okay, and that's where a lot of the history of our travels and our, our buzz comes from, is from the, from the whakapapa. And that was one whole school of learning. It was whakapapa was that important that you were taught it over and over again so that you'd never forget it. Therefore, you'd never forget where you came from and that sort of thing. Deciding to head to the legendary homeland of Kalonika Keke, or the Pacific Northwest, we choose Haida Gwaii, the homeland of the Haida Nation, 
as we are fascinated by the similarity and meaning of the names Hawaii and Gwaii, both which mean homeland. And we wanted to see if they placed a similar importance on remembering oral history. When a child was born, they would watch them very closely in the and all the men in the longhouse with white hair, meaning the elders, would choose a youngster. And, in, and as soon as he started talking, I suppose, they started a certain amount of training. Mm -hmm. And then it would progress until they would relate a section of the creation stories one night, and the next night it was up to the trainee to relate word for word perfectly what he had heard the night before. And the minute he made one mistake, everything was shut down and everyone had to go to bed and start again the next day. A quick recap then. We heard from Aletha in Kauai, Nettie and Jason in New Zealand, and then from Diane in Haidu Gwaii, all stressing that oral histories are taken very seriously indeed. Why do the scientific papers ignore them? Returning to the legend, one part that fascinates us is the story relating to Chief Nu'u and his family's arrival in Hawaii from Kalonika Keke. Although Aletha had not heard of Chief Nu'u, she suggested that the people of Molokai may know of him as they hold on to some of the older legends. The only place that my, my great-grandmother went was to Molokai, mm -hmm. and that was to replenish her mana. She would go there periodically. Mm -hmm. Molokai was known as one of the most powerful spiritual places. Now we've heard of a lady called Auntie Snooky, who is the keeper of genealogies in Molokai. So that's where we're off to next. As we approach the island, mysterious structures in the ocean hint at a deeper history. According to my um, documentation here, his name is Nu'u o Kahina Li'i. Auntie Snooky's genealogy has provided us with an independent source of confirmation of Nu'u's existence, his wife Lilinoe, and their three sons. This genealogy, which places Chief Nu'u's arrival in Hawaii approximately 2,200 years ago, is very exciting because it agrees with the findings of geneticist Bing Su and Mark Stone King that, and I quote, Eastern Polynesian DNA showed a rapid population growth from a small isolated group 2,200 years ago. Could this small, isolated group actually be Nu and his family? And could this legend really hold the key to the colonization of Hawaii? Let's listen to it one more time. Nu traveled from Alaska with his wife, Lili Noe, their three sons and their three wives, in a canoe called the Royal Canoe of the Continent. And it came to rest upon Mauna Kea, the white mountain on the island of Hawaii. We're on the top of Mauna Kea. This would have been the mountain that Chief Nu would have seen from his boat way out there on the Pacific. Maybe 200 miles out, he would have seen this mountain with snow on top and he named it White Mountain and he headed straight for it and then he would have found the cliffs of Hawaii. Closing in on the island he would have seen a treacherous lethal coastline of rugged cliffs and nowhere to land until he reached the safety of the Waipia Valley. This is the beach, the very beach, that 2,200 years ago, Chief Nu would have arrived and they would have seen these incredibly steep 
sides, this valley with this wonderful river flowing out into the ocean, and they would have seen a safe haven. They would have recognized it as something very similar to their own origins, where they've come from, from Canada, from Alaska, from Kalonika Keke. And they would have known that this was a place they could make their home. Those valleys are eroding and covering, every time it floods, it covers it with silt, little layers year by year. Mm. So slowly stuff gets down deeper and deeper in a, in a alluvial valley like that. All you've got to do is dig down and you will find some old stuff in there for yeah. sure. And they haven't done that. Why haven't they done that? The people in this valley, who I believe came from Canada and Alaska, where they have ice and sleds, used to have a sport where they'd slide down the grassy slopes on a sled. Kalonika Keke or Alaska seems to be the key here. And the only person who has investigated this concept to any depth was Tor Heyerdahl. Tor Heyerdahl, famed for his Kontiki expedition, proved that Pacific travel by sailing rafts was possible. And he was also a proponent of a northwest coastal provenance of the Polynesian people. Let's have a look and see what it was that grabbed his attention. We're going to have a chat with the curator of archaeology here, Dr. Grant Keddy. And we will be really interested to see what his ideas are about our hypothesis of the origins of the Polynesian people. Tor Heyerdahl, like you know, most scientists, they ch as the new information comes in, they change their mind. He was a very open-minded person who looked at many different things, had a broad interest, but he was always looking for more and more data. Later in his life, when uh, Tor Heyerdahl visited me at the museum here, we talked about a lot of this stuff, and he was, uh, unfortunately, he died before he got into some of these, these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you ask the question, do we have any evidence of connection between native people in the northwest coast and Polynesia? Well, we don't have any evidence that's clear right now, but did it happen? Well, it's certainly possible it happened. We, some Polynesians made it to shore here, native people made it to there. It's certainly possible, knowing only what we know about ocean currents and, and canoe travel and that sort of thing. You know, now that we know a lot more about the history of the northwest coast, uh, and a lot more about the history of Polynesia. What is the what should we be looking for? If you're if you're to look to parallels with Polynesia, uh, I can show you these bird figures that look like the bird figures on Easter Island, right? Then you've got things like these uh, you know bone clubs and stuff, and you could probably find certain bone clubs that are similar in Polynesia. So they're they're uh, you know the, one can look at the symbolism and everything in there and say, well, is there any kind of patterns or designs, you know, you look at that when you say, mm -hmm. whoa, that kind of remnants of the, those you know, mm -hmm. Hawaiian hats, right? There's two types of canoe bailers on the west coast, the same two type in Polynesia. Uh, hand malls appear on the coast here, say around 2,200 years ago, so that's definitely before they occur in Polynesia, right? You have the stirrup, what we call the stirrup-shaped malls, uh, that come in several different varieties. So those are strictly on the northern coast. The ones that uh, you know have the T-shaped tops, like the like the poi pounders, uh, those are strictly northern coast. Uh, but the northern coast ones don't have you know the flared bottoms, right? So one of the other artifacts that I'm looking for is I'm going to do a thing on combs from the Ozette site, mm -hmm. and they right. look just like tattoo combs from Polynesia. This archaeological site called Ozette was buried by a mudslide 250 years ago and has since brought up many interesting artefacts. Grant continued to show us numerous artefacts that hinted at the connection between Polynesia and the northwest coast. Now you could see that those eyes, this is the only one that has eyes with that particular motif. There's a few Polynesian things that are sort of close to that, you know. If it's a piece of crap, it goes to archaeology, and if it's not, <laughs> that's from the ethnologist's point of view, right? In addition to the, uh, the bone ones, you have some that are stone, and, uh, you know, yes. beautiful, made a lot of work put into that kind of thing. The, the question of connections between Polynesia and here is not on their agenda, you know? So when you say, why aren't people studying Polynesia, they just, they don't know anything about it. Mm. 
and you get people in British Columbia that know nothing about the archaeology of Washington and, and vice versa. Yet, how can you be a good archaeologist and not know what's in the neighboring areas? You know, so so I'm looking at clubs. I'm looking at tattoo tattoo things, bark beaters, bark shredders. But obviously, doing you know doing DNA on skeletal material, something like that, would be you know to, would pretty well clinch it. Tor Heyerdahl's research led us to Grant Keddy, who has confirmed the likelihood of long-distance canoe travel and has shown us a multitude of artefacts that are so similar that one has to ask, are these people indeed cousins across the sea? So leaving Grant in the beautiful city of Victoria, we decide to get back on the little plane for the very long journey with a very short pit stop back to Haida Gwaii to see what else can we uncover that illustrates the connections between Polynesia and the northwest coast. I'm standing outside the Haida Heritage Centre, a building that has been built for the Haida people to learn more about their culture through their dancing and through their songs. After a very sodden celebration of the Haida Heritage Centre's anniversary, we were able to catch up with Sean Young, the archaeologist on contract to the museum here. And it has to be said that Sean looks very Polynesian. We always make jokes with them that either vice versa. We're like, well, maybe you came from here and just left here because the weather sucked and you <laughs> wanted to go somewhere where it's nice. Because it would make no sense leaving Hawaii and coming here where the weather sucks. <laughs> um, I understand that the Haida do earth ovens. Quite similar to the Maori, build a fire, big cobbles, get it really hot, like pretty much let it burn for half a day and then let it burn down. Remove the cobbles, Dig the pit up, because you take the heat from where it was dug. Put your big cobbles in the bottom and start layering it with your leaves and stuff. And, and we use burlap sacks and stuff, like wet them. Same as the leaves, wet them and put all your food there and cover them again with the leaves and then burlap sacks. And then fill up the earth on top from the fire and then leave it for half a day. From the Haida, just south of Alaska, to the Maori of New Zealand. Their earth ovens are almost identical. What else did we find? We have talked to a gentleman called Robert Cross who has a son who was born with a birthmark on the lower part of his back. And they spent some time in Hawaii. And there in Hawaii, this child was accepted, acknowledged as being of Hawaiian blood because apparently there is this a birthmark on a lot of Hawaiian uh, people, this lower back birthmark. It's not a tattoo, it is like a genetic marker. We were pleased to hear from Cliff Thompson in New Zealand that this birthmark is a characteristic of most Polynesians. All of us, yeah. all of us, every single Māori has, has one born on It's like a bruise. Yes. On, on the back side here, yeah. and it just disappears in time. Okay. During our research, we noticed that there were many connections between Canada and Polynesia, including place names and voyaging stories. So how adventurous were the Haida on the ocean? Haida is pretty much in a nutshell where the Vikings of the Northwest Coast. Well, we traded a lot. Yeah. We intermarried with certain nations, but we also raided and brought war to a lot of nations from the Thlinket in southern Alaska all the way down past Washington State. Yeah. Our canoes were found in Northern California. Sean's description of extensive canoe travel reminds me of the stories that Grant Keddy told us back in Victoria. So there's actually these oral traditions talking about named individuals. He took his family and they left, and often never to be heard from again. <laughs> and so where did, where did many of these people end up? Out to sea somewhere, we never hear those stories. And, and um, 
So there's only this this one this one height of story. A, a man and a woman went out in uh, were out fishing in a canoe. They got blown out to sea, and they were they were continued to be blown out to sea for three weeks. They came to a place where there were people wearing red, and one can interpret that as you know uh, red cloaks of a Hawaiian island or something like that. But all we know is that they're wearing some kind of they were described as being sort of red on the upper part and and uh, they these people treated them nicely they stayed with them they fed them they stayed there for five years then they told them it was time to go and they said because you live to the east to the rising sun which then by that alone implies that you're on an island somewhere away offshore they taught them how to follow the birds and they mentioned specific birds that did this migration so these people left and the bird landed on their canoe and when the bird left they changed the direction of their boat to where the bird went and they kept doing this the birds would land on their canoe and they kept changing direction so they got they found they got back home by following the birds that were heading heading to the shore grant and sean have confirmed for us that ocean travel between the northwest coast and hawaii is totally plausible on several counts the most important point he makes here is that these early seafarers had total faith in following the birds Ornithological studies have shown that these birds fly from Canada to New Zealand every year and the Pacific voyagers would have used them along with their detailed knowledge of ocean swells and star navigation to reach the far-flung corners of the Polynesian Triangle. These ancient voyaging routes were preserved in their chants as evidenced here by this beautiful Haida story told by author Barry Brailsford. I'm going to tell you about the visit by the elder from the Haida and, and his son. And as soon as I met them, I knew it was a time of ceremony in as much as he brought great mana and so did his son, that this was a very special visit that they're making to this land. And the Haida put on all their gear, their beautiful costumes, and, uh, and then they told their stories, and they told the story of sailing to Japan and back and other voyages, but also the story of coming to New Zealand a long time ago and then sailing home again. When they tried to explain, in response to the questions, how they navigated, in fact how they got to Hawaii, which whether they were starting to release to the world. We'd, we'd been places. We, we had great abilities on the ocean. To get to Hawaii, they followed the hummingbird. The hummingbird doesn't go beyond the shore. How did you follow the hummingbird? Of course, what they didn't understand was that the hummingbird was a star pattern. I think if you could go to a newspaper in Hokianga back in 1938, you might discover there a report about an old man, a grandfather from the Haida, who took his son called Grey Wolf, who was then just 12, and said, we're going to make a seagoing kayak. And they took two years to do it, according to Grey Wolf. And the grandfather told the lad, we're going to make a great journey to a land far away across the ocean. And they arrived in the Hokianga in New Zealand in 1938. And they stayed for a time, then they went back again. And Grey Wolf came here in the early 1990s and shared his story. Puts this whole understanding of how these people were capable of making such amazing journeys and returning from whence they came. It puts back there the, the amazing, amazing abilities of people of long ago. Abilities that we've set aside don't even bring to mind. What was fascinating about Barry's account of the Hyder's visit is that they followed an ancestral sailing route that took them straight to Hokianga Harbour, the landing place of Kupe. Kupe, and he is probably the one who is said to have discovered New Zealand. 
Okay, and he landed up in Hokianga Harbour, which is up there, and he fashioned an ads, green stain ads, mm. down the South Island, and it took it back. Thomas Couple must have came quite a few generations after that, but he ended up with the ads, which he, you know, he got someone to fashion the Te Arawa canoe with. The connection between coupe and greenstone is intriguing, as it was a prized material in both New Zealand and the west coast of Canada. Is this a clue as to where coupe originally came from? So they, they would make finished jade artifacts up in the interior of the province and trade those down to the coast. And they're actually cutting these with pieces of schist that have garnet in them. So garnet's actually, mm -hmm. this is, definitely it's very hard, but garnet's harder. Mm -hmm. They sawed this through from both sides and snapped it off and then ground it down. A lot of work uh, went, went into these things. Green stone to us is the most valuable stone in the world. More valuable to us than, than gold. What other culture in the world holds it up in that sort of significance? Definitely the Chinese, Chinese or the pre-Chinese, you know? Yeah, and the Haida, so you've got the Canadian natives as well. And it's probably for the same reason too. It's a connection to spirit, you know, spirituality. Continuing on our quest, we head to a place where Tor Heyerdahl noticed some interesting ancient petroglyphs. We're going to get ourselves on a boat and we're going to go for a whole day to a place called Belakula. And Belakula will hold surprises and treasures that we have yet to imagine. It's pretty chilly but it's not too bad. It is kind of nose freezing kind of weather but never mind. As we come into the little harbour of Belakula, we're reminded of the high cliffs of the Waipio Valley. This is, in fact, the place that Tor Heyerdahl believed the Polynesians first came from. A man named Tor Heyerdahl, he built a raft and he crossed the Pacific to prove that that travel was done. And his son stood here with, with me about eight, nine years ago, Thor Heyerdahl's sons. They were retracing their father's footsteps, his life, having them walking around here. I thought, wow, this is history, you know, this is history. I believe it was like the Māori people were known to be travelers of the Pacific Ocean. They traveled to Pacific Rim looking for a place to call their own. And I believe they came in looking in here. We got this phone call from friend in Auckland. He said, oh, I've come across these harder people who are going around trying to find people who know about the ancient voyaging and they've found no one and they go in two days and can you help them? One of the stories they shared was quite amazing for me and that, uh, well, we were both stunned by it. With the San Andreas fault line running right up through to Alaska, and through the islands, you know, there was a lot of earthquake activity, a lot going on. And now at extreme low tides, they were actually finding there were squares of rock or rectangles of rock the size of refrigerators and more that were squared on all sides. And they couldn't understand what these were. They were starting to intrigue them. So they made a big effort and they cleaned off all the marine life, and they found that there were carvings in the stone. And, and we know nothing of these. We don't know what these symbols are. So they shared a lot of things, and then the elders shared some of their voyaging stories. It was a, a lovely occasion, you know, that was very supportive. And then the old lady, she, she looked at the tohunga, just gave a little nod and said, and he knew to go to the corner where there were five talking sticks. I've seen them, there's always four or five there. And he took each stick in turn and he looked at it, then he chose one and he brought it back and he gifted it to the old one. 
Well, they left late in the day, early the next morning, and they had to fly to Vancouver. And when they arrived, their shaman from the village was actually waiting for them. He couldn't bear to wait at home. He just had to make sure the old one was safe. He was there at the airport, and when they came out, the old one was carrying the talking stick, the tuka tuka. Mm -hmm. And he placed it in front of the shaman, held it like this, and the shaman took it and looked at it and turned it over and looked at it and turned it over and looked at it, held it close and he wept over it. Because on the stick were carved the symbols that were on the stones that were coming out of the ocean. In the creation of the world, when the earth was yet cold and frozen, we didn't have our sun or our stars yet. Our elders say everything was chawisus, the color of copper, or a golden color. Mm -hmm. That was the color of the world before we had the sun. That's my new chalk name, chawisus, the color of the world before the sun and stars. This reminds us of a similar legend that we heard while we were in Haida Gwaii. The Haida, they have a legend of the sky and the earth being the same colour and that at some stage there is uh, a person or creature that has created a separation between the land and the sky. And this is a very, very important part of their creation legends. The Maori of New Zealand also have a very similar legend of the separation of the sky from Mother Earth. Danginui is, um, is the sky father and Papa Tuanuku is our earth mother. And um, there is a legend that they were locked in an embrace and that was prior to being separated by the gods that lived in between them, which were their children. In Nia Bay in Washington State, just down the road from the Ozette site, Micah McCarthy, a Macaw tribal leader, also talk to us about their separation of the sky legend. Western science a number of years ago sort of validated uh, uh, the, the legend that there was a time when people couldn't see the sun because earth was enshrouded by such a heavy cloud and fog cover that for generations people never got a chance to see the sun or the moon. It just got light and dark and no, nobody could see the stars or the sky and so there's a story in the Puget Sound about lifting up the sky, because if the clouds were so low. Micah, the Haida, Nettie and Chris are all telling the same ancient legend. So what are these stories depicting? What could have caused the sun and the stars to be obscured from view for so many generations? One possibility is that a comet struck the Canadian ice shield nearly 13,000 years ago, triggering volcanoes and filling the atmosphere with dust. This comet showered southeastern America with bullets of water that gouged out 500,000 craters known as the Carolina Bays. It also showered North America with microscopic nanodiamonds that can still be found in the sediments today. Sad to say, there would have been few survivors. Subsequently, there was a significant repopulation of America around 12 and a half thousand years ago from East Asia by a seafaring people who carried a characteristic female DNA marker known as haplogroup B. The arrival in Canada of this female DNA is recorded in an old Chilcot story which says some strange people came from the Western Ocean. Among them were two sisters. They landed on Doll Island in southeastern Alaska. There, the sisters met and married men whose people were coming down the rivers from the interior. One sister went with her family to Haida Gwaii. Her children grew and multiplied into the Haida nation. The other sister went with her family to Prince of Wales Island became the ancestress or mother of the Tlingit nation. What is most interesting is that the people of the Pacific Northwest and the Polynesians share a unique piece of DNA called HLA-BW48, once thought to be unique 
to the Polynesians. This genetic relationship between the Polynesians and the people of coastal Canada shows that they were all part of the same group that left East Asia to travel across the North Pacific via the Kuroshio Current about 12,000 years ago. This migration event from the East is also recorded in a Hawaiian oral tradition describing the adventures of Hawaii Loa. Adventures which took place so long ago that Hawaii was geographically quite different. He left from the Yellow Sea on a fishing expedition, traveling east with the constellation of Pleiades, which led him to the islands of Hawaii. After reprovisioning his ship, he sailed back to East Asia, gathered up his family and returned to colonize the idyllic islands of Hawaii. The genealogy of Hawaii Loa shows that he lived many generations before Papa Tuanaku and Ranginui, before the time of chaos and before the great floods at the end of the last ice age that not only flooded the coastal plains of East Asia, but also the islands of Hawaii. The Hukumu Kalani Hukumu Kahonoa says that there were people living in Hawaii before these great floods. Up until about 7,000 years ago, the Hawaiian Islands formed an island chain over 2,500 kilometers long, stretching far into the North Pacific. This would have presented an ideal stopover for seafarers. I have an idea. There might have been people living there a very long time ago. Let's have a deeper look now at what this legend actually says. The first man and woman who came from Alaska to Hawaii were Kalonike Keke and his wife Humue Apule. They were said to be high chiefs of the people of the East and the people of the West. They arrived in Hawaii before it was disrupted by a great flood. This great flood carried away from Hawaii a floating log of wood which then drifted all the way back to Alaska. If the history of Hawaiian habitation is as deep as these legends suggest, what other evidence can we find to back it up? According to our own handed down yeah. oral histories, yeah. It goes very far back. It goes a long way back. We're in the middle of the Pacific Sea. All of the Hawaiian chain. Each has their own energy and their own quality. So I dare not speak on the different islands. But I will speak of Molokai. And Molokai is the pico of the universe. When time began, it began here. And after the flood, many went out. But in the now, they are coming back home. It was a whole continent in the Pacific Ocean, as Atlantis was a continent in the Atlantic Ocean. Hawaii itself dates back to the time when Sumerians was writing Sumeria, uh, we were called the Mu people. The Mu? Mu, M-U. Probably your times of your mystical times and all that Atlantis and all yeah. those times. Yeah. So yeah. Nobody charted an ocean like we did. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Like they were sailing around the world from the times they were building Egypt, they said. Yeah. Yeah. What other evidence is there in Hawaii that people were living here in ancient times? Over here is a fully functioning fish pond. It's actually called the fish pond of the kings. These fish ponds are ancient in design and they are being renovated and restored as much as possible. What they haven't been able to restore, however, 
are the other fish ponds that you actually can only see through Google Earth or if you actually dive on them. And those are the ones that are even further out here. They're exactly the same design, but they are now anything between one and two meters below the surface of the ocean. So at some stage, somebody built those fish ponds out there and the water has now risen above them or the land has sunk down, possibly a combination of them both. But what is interesting about these islands is that almost in every single case, there is subsidence of the islands of about four and a half inches every 50 years. But what's out to be in our reckoning about five meters every 2,000 years. Which of course begs the question that if there has been people here for a lot longer than the scientists say, do we not think there'd be an awful lot of artifacts underneath the sea? One place that has yet to be fully explored underwater is a rocky islet jutting out of the ocean 480 kilometers northwest of Hawaii. It is called Makumana Mana, Island of Great Reverence. This island was originally 70 by 40 kilometers in size and it still features 36 sacred heiaus. It is situated directly under the path of the star constellation known as Matariki or Pleiades. Matariki is considered to be the navigational homing constellation for Hawaiiki, the ancestral homeland of most Polynesians, as mentioned here by artist and historian Kerry Strongman. This is a Heitiki, which is uh, said to be one of our ancestors that came from, again from Matariki or the Pleiades. Um, most of the Polynesian uh, cultures acknowledge that we came from that star system. On the island of Mokumana Mana, curious stone statues were found. Could these be an indication of the Menahuni, the earliest people in the Hawaiian Islands? Remnants of this culture are most apparent on Kauai, the closest island to Mokumana Mana. Perhaps Aletha could cast some light on this question. First people were the Menehunis. Mm. William Hyde Rice was a collector of legends here on Kauai. I believe he was the beginning of enhancing them as little people, as leprechauns, or whatever you want to call <laughs> them, you know. Anthropologists have never found any small skeletal remains to say that we had uh, a population of, of two little people. No, <laughs> never had that. They did a census, and a few people uh, that wrote in many Huni, and they were from the Waineha uh, on the North Shore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Down near the Waimea River, there is a thing called the Menahuni Ditch. It is said that these people were here before times of the Hawaiian and they were an engineering sort of people who knew how to build fish ponds and ditches and we just met some people who live here right here in the Waimea Valley and those people have just said that their ancestors were of Menahuni extraction. The people in that valley have maintained that ditch right through the years and there are these people that looked a little bit different to your average Hawaiian and I said are you connected to the people that built this ditch and they said oh yeah we are we are Menahuni and he had this he um, had a top knot he had this top knot with you know, a stick and, and through it the Menahuni tie their hair up in a top knot and put a stick through it because your family's always lived here always lived yeah yeah you still farm here yeah live yeah. right down the road taro or yeah. a taro but I, I'm not connected to the ditch you're not connected no my husband is. yeah my husband is <laughs> Okay, so here we have ancient sunken fish ponds, numerous shrines on remnant islands, mysterious statues and tales of the Menahuni. How much deeper can it get? Surely this validates yet again the veracity of our legend. Why has this history been forgotten and what happened to the Menahuni? 
And when the Tahitians came, they were put to work. They became the slaves. Oh. Now, in Tahiti, if you look at that word, slave is manahune. This Tahitian invasion of approximately 1240 AD is what many archaeologists believe establishes the time of the initial colonization of these islands. This is when the warrior Pa'au invaded the islands of Hawaii, an invasion that changed everything. There was a man called Pa'au who came from the islands of Tahiti and he saw that there were a peaceful people living here. He came back with a whole band of warriors, several ships, and he landed on these shores ready to corrupt the leaders and the gods of the Hawaiians and change the entire system. He changed the entire system by bringing in a kapu system, which is like a punishment system, whereby the smallest infringement of the law that he laid down would be dealt with by death. The Tahitians brought the rank yes. uh, and, oh. and the, the, elite, the nobility, the commoners, the slaves. Yeah. It was all after the Tahitians came. Prior. Society changed. Yeah. And so, you know what, we celebrate and we say, oh, this is Hawaiian culture. It's not the true it's Hawaiian not. culture. It's, it's, it's been yeah. flavored in um, mm. Tahitian. Now, the scientists who call themselves the chronological hygienists suggest that the large ceremonial sites here in Hawaii were built after the Tahitian invasion. But is this so? Because of the position of this particular heia and the fact that it sits on this wonderful natural bay, which would have been deep enough to bring ships in, there would have been structures here prior to this particular heia being built. Tragically, there was another heia sitting here in the water. Now this heia has sadly disappeared altogether. There was a certain amount of interaction with explosive devices and that could have had something to do with the fact that that heiau is no longer visible, uh, which is a pity. It was visible up till about 1950. There's another heiau over that way called Mu'ukini. It was actually built in 480 AD. That's 1500 years ago. So with the scientific paperwork that says that there have been people here only, let's, let's be generous and say 1,200 years, where did the people come from to build that heiau? Ostensibly, according to the records, they needed 18,000 people to build it. And they brought large volcanic rock from 40 miles away to build that heiau Mukini. Where did these people come from if there was no population? It seems to me that there must have been an awful lot more people here than the scientists are willing actually to admit. So it seems that there is a lot of circumstantial evidence suggesting that people have been living in Hawaii for a lot longer than is commonly believed. If so, Polynesians have actually been here since before the floods that came after the last ice age. Just like the legend says. It is logical, therefore, to assume Hawaii is in fact the crucible of Polynesian society. Hawaii, the homeland. Legend says our lava tube up here in Wailua connects from here to New Zealand. Oh, and there's really? a rock in New Zealand that's pointed up and there's a spring water. Anyways, the water is said to be from Hawaii. Oh. When they die, uh, the people in New Zealand, they believe that their souls come here. Our quest in this film was to establish if 800 years of habitation of the Hawaiian Islands, as asserted by some scientific papers, stacks up against the ancient legend of Hukumukalani, who 
Kukuma Kahonua. What have we discovered? Oral traditions are revered by the people and ignored by most scientists. Archaeologists agree that canoe travel of that era is highly plausible. We have seen that ancient legends from the northwest coast are very similar to those of Polynesia. But most compelling is the multitude of tools, artifacts and canoe designs that are so similar that one could imagine that the Polynesians and the people of the northwest coast were indeed cousins across the sea. The Hawaiian people have a right to their true ancestry. What will it take to publicly acknowledge this legend and give Solomon Peleolani back his deserved place in history and share with the Hawaiian people the full legend of Hukumo Kalani, Hukumo Kahonoa? <laughs>